Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Samar Shorafa, co-founder of uh, She's Arab. Uh, it's a pleasure to partner today with an organization that truly aligns with uh, She's Arab's work. Uh, so on behalf of uh, Nabra al Busaidi, the executive director of the Young Arab Leaders, I'd like to say a few words about the uh, Young Arab Leaders. If you can please uh, move on to the next slide. The Young Arab Leaders is a not-for-profit organization founded during the World Economic Forum in 2004 under the patronage of His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, uh, Vice President and Prime Minister of the UAE and ruler of Dubai. Uh, YAL seeks to develop the next generation of leaders in the Arab world through its strong network of industry and business leaders to serve as mentors and role models to the youth and entrepreneurs across the region. Um, at She is Arab, we are working to address the issue of underrepresentation of Arab women in business and at speaking events uh, through offering services such as uh, speaker bureau services, professional development, advisory, and events. Uh, we have uh, partnered with the Young Arab Leaders on an Arab Women in Leadership series. So this is the this marks the first of this series, and it's a great topic. We have a great uh, lineup for today. We have uh, Fatma Ghali and Amina Ghali. Uh, Fatma is the CEO of Azza Fahmi Jewelry and Amina is the head designer at Azza Fahmi Jewelry. Welcome, ladies. Um, they have, of course, firsthand experience of growing up as part of a family business um, and have achieved remarkable growth in uh, positioning the brand on a global scale, not just the regional one. And uh, we also have a uh, Young Arab Leader speaker, Farida Al Agami. I personally call her a reference point on family businesses and women in family businesses in particular. She is the co founder of Women in Family Business and she's the managing director of the Tarawat Family Business Forum. It's uh, great to have you here with us today. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, so I'm particularly excited about today's topic about family businesses because I myself grew as part of a family business. Uh, so uh, I may have a few things to share here and there as well. Um, it resonates with me and, uh, and I believe that it's such a timely topic. Uh, I just coincidentally as well attended a webinar earlier today uh, with the PwC that talked about uh, family businesses, and they were saying that it actually contributes to 70% of the Middle East GDP, not 60%, 70%, and it employs 80% of the workforce, which is uh, quite significant. So let's start with uh, the basics. Farida will help us set the scene with a couple of slides. If we can move to that, please. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Samar, for the kind introduction. Uh, ladies, it's, uh, it's an honor to be in your presence. Uh, I've been a great fan of everything that you've done for a long time, so uh, I'm truly delighted to, to see you again and, and to be here with you uh, and, of course, with uh, our audience. Um, what I wanted to do today is uh, briefly in two very short slides, um, perhaps set the scene for the conversation on family businesses and on women in family businesses. So as Samar just mentioned, um, why should we talk about family businesses in general? It's because of course, the private sector actually around the world um, is in, by majority is owned by families. So it's owned, run by families. It is not something that is generally known. Uh, it is not something that we perceive as um, as, as being common knowledge. Uh, we have a tendency to look at the economy through the lens of industries and not through the lens of who owns and operates these entities. And I believe that that um, actually is a, is, is, is a pity because I think looking at corporations from the angle of who operates and who owns adds to so much of understanding, to so much understanding of how companies behave and why they behave in a certain way. Why do they grow in a certain way? 
So embedded in this large topic, of course, we have this, this conversation on um, the inclusion of women, more women in leadership. I believe that um, also in the Middle East, it's been a topic that has been uh, you know, brought up for over, I would say, a, a good part of two decades now. It's been a common conversation. There are you know, seminars and workshops, and, and it, it, it kind of seems to be part of the, of the right thing to say when we talk about female empowerment. But I'd like to question that a little bit as well. Um, now we'll go back to the first slide, please. Um, I'd like to question that a little bit because I think that sometimes we don't have this conversation set in the right context. The conversation on, around female leadership and the empowerment of the individual, to me, is set in the context of the overall conversation of diversity. Diversity and inclusion in corporate leadership. And um, it is a, right now we have finally, finally come to a point where academic research actually proves the point that having diverse leadership and a diverse workforce is actually good for business. Um, it adds to its capacity to innovate. Um, it, it changes the corporate culture for the better. And it leads to greater innovation. So I just put a couple of statistics. I'm not going to go into them in detail. but. Really, when you do a little bit of research, you see that overall, the case for diversity and inclusion is overwhelming. Now, a part of that, of course, is gender diversity. Gender diversity, both in leadership as well as in the workforce overall. And I think in family businesses, this conversation is actually very, very interesting. Um, if we go to the next slide. So there is, um, I tried to show you a little bit a comparison um, between the Fortune 500 companies um, and family businesses. So what are the statistics telling us? In Fortune 500 companies, top management, in top management, we can find 13.8% women represented. Boards have 14.7% of female members. And we have 15% of the CEOs of Fortune, Fortune 500 companies are women. So overall, not overwhelmingly fantastic, uh, I would say. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, and, and I, I want to give you here a caveat, because of course, um, the research, the basis for research was very different for these two studies, but I still wanted to kind of give you a little bit of contrast. Family businesses are doing slightly better, interestingly enough. So, in family businesses, in top management, you will find around 22% uh, female representation. Board members are at about 16%. But the interesting number um, that they found in an e uh, Ernst & Young research is that the rate, the increase of numbers of women represented both in the executive level, at the executive level, as well as in, on boards, is much higher than in Fortune 500 companies. So I found that quite interesting. Um, and I think what will be a great opportunity in this conversation is to address a lot of different topics around this. The first topic, in my opinion, that should be addressed is why don't we have more insight and research into family businesses uh, and the role of women in family businesses? And um, I think there's, there's a lot to be said also about visi visible roles versus non-visible roles. And I'll, I'll go into that a little bit uh, later on. The second point that I'd like to highlight here is this question of um, what, how does family culture influence the reality of having more women on corporate, uh, in, in corporate positions, in visible corporate positions? I think that is a very, a very big question as well. And, and finally, I believe that we have to contrast this conversation and we have to contextualize this conversation. The conversation on women and family businesses has to be seen as, on the one hand, as I said before, a question around a macro level approach. So why do we need diversity? Going forward, our world is only growing more complex. We will need more opinions. We will need more points of view in order to have successful businesses going forward. And of course, women can bring that to the table. That's the one perspective that you can have. The other perspective is kind of the individual perspective, is that, you know, the right of every individual to realize themselves and to, to live their talents to the best of their ability. 
So I think those are kind of a couple of comments for me to just contextualize a little bit how I see this topic going forward. Great. Thank you so much, Farida, for this uh, insightful info to help us set the scene. Um, again, uh, Aza Fahmi just recently, uh, you recently celebrated 50 years of existence, huh? yes. uh, It's wonderful. Uh, I think we can start with uh, showing the amazing pictures that you shared with us from your uh, childhood to uh, put some context into the questions we're going to ask you now. Uh, it's lovely to see uh, how you participated in exhibitions as children and so on. Tell us about this and how it has contributed to who you've become today, the leaders that you've become today. This is your... Let's start with Amina. I feel like I'm, I'm looking at one of the pictures and I feel like I'm going to cry because I don't know whether any it's, uh, it's been... First of all, uh, thank you so much for in the introduction, uh, Samar, and thank you for the insight, Farida. It was incredible just to see the difference between the family businesses and the Fortune 500 uh, companies. Um, as Samar was just saying, our journey, Fatma's journey and I had started a very long time ago. My mother was a single mother, so, uh, and it was a growing business. Uh, she started in 1969 and around the mid eighties, Fatma and I were, early eight, sorry, Fatma and I were born. And uh, whenever we would uh, travel to exhibitions, she really didn't have an option but to take us. She, you know, we, we were her two little girls and she would send to whatever company or whatever um, uh, person who was, who was taking us on an exhibition saying my two assistants w are coming. So actually um, we started uh, working with my mother at the age of four. Uh, the one on the left is an exhibition that we went to for almost 15 years called Art in Action. It was in Oxford, uh, England, and we would go and set up the booth and put the ticket price and she would teach us everything there is to know about jewelry and about everything. Um, and we would help her sell. And in summers, I think for the first 10, 15 years of our life, every summer she would insist that we would work for almost a month in, uh, in our workshop, just to learn how to do little things, how to file, how to bead, how to, the difference of stones, the difference in techniques. Um, so it's like you, we, we took the, the business very, very early on to the point where it's like you, you knew, you didn't, this is all you knew, you know? Fatma, I don't know if you want to... Yeah, I think it's uh, because it's a question that I'm, we're always asked, like, when did you start working or when did you join Aza Fahmi? So there's like the official date, <laughs> but then there's the forever, you know, like ever since I've, I've known anything, like, like, I mean, I was saying my, my mother didn't have much choice. So we were there. We were there with her in the afternoons. We'd, we'd sit in our shop in Mohansin, you know, we'd study there and we'd do whatever um in the workshops in the summer so it's really something that started ever since we were very very young i remember like even in front of the television um in 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 craftsmanship and jewelry you use beeswax oh. um for you to uh make the saw slide without the net breaking so she would give us honey honey and she would ask us to chew on it and then she would explain mm -hmm. why we need the the wax. The, the wax for the workshop the next day that's so, amazing. <laughs> so you even know where you source everything from, what you need it for. And Fatma, this is your picture in the workshop at a very young age. Yes, I was, I was very young here. But again, we've always been part of the business. So even if it was not officially, we've always been a part of, of the business. And, and my mother is really, I want to say it's, it's not just a passion for her. Like it's, it's, it's who she is. It's, a, it's who she is. It's an obsession. You know, she's like completely taken by what she does. So it's, it's in everything that she does. So you become a part of this world, which when, you, when we officially join the business, uh, it makes it very helpful. Because like you're saying, yes, Amar, you know, every tiny little detail, you know how things are done at the, at the very, 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 detailed micro level so it's really really been very helpful in what we do today both of us Amazing. of course supported by a lot of education along the way a lot of mentorship a lot of i mean we wouldn't have been here without, without all that but taking that time to know all these tiny details uh, i think is what's helped us be who we are today and i think what was very interesting to adding to what fatma's saying is that i remember a conversation with my mother i must have been 12 and fatma she was 15 
And my mother sat us down and she said, look, I am trying to build something to pass on. But if you girls are not interested, I am happy to stay at the size that we are. I am happy not to develop it for a second generation. And you girls are free to do whatever it is that you want to do. Mm-hmm. And I remember Fatma and I looked at each other like, what is she talking about? Like, of course, mm-hmm. we're going <laughs> of course, we're going to continue. So it living. was never forced upon you. It was also, it grew as like being part of you, part of your being, part of who you are. That's, that's amazing. And how has that influenced um, your leadership journey? Like, what do you think you as women leaders, because just to bring perspective to the audience, you're, you're only two sisters, you have no brothers and your mother was a single mother so this is really this is what you knew you know this is there was no other alternative for you this is this is how you were you were just born into it you were born into the business and you grew up um, with it so do you think that there are any unique uh, perhaps characteristics that women uh, bring uh, as leaders to the business i think um it's, a, it's, it's not an easy question to answer. Um, because like you said, we know no other. So it's, it's always been our option. But I think, uh, I think one of the, 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 the important things that women bring into, into the business is um, what I believe today is more of a balance. Mm-hmm. So I think over time, the things have gone to a, a very uh, logical, very... Um, uh, it's all about efficiency. It's all about logic. It's all about, you know, the best possible outcome. And, it's, and that's changing today. And it's, I, I don't like to say women because some men have that too. And some women don't have that. So it's not women, but generally women have that sense comes more naturally to them. But you see major companies today are moving to all that ba- towards that balance. And it's that culture of more heart. at the end of the day. Yeah. It's bringing a bit more heart into things we do because at the end of the day, we are human. So we're not, humans by night and machines in the morning. So the, the, the same person that walks into the office in the morning is also a human being, you know? And I think that's part of, that comes naturally and easily to a lot of women. It also does to some men, but, uh, so I think that that bit of um, the feminine energy, whether you're a man or a woman, but that balance between the masculine and the feminine is something that's very important. And I think it's something that we are seeing very much today is a rising trend. And that and connectivity. Sorry, go ahead, that, Amina. That connectivity mm-hmm. that I think that comes more naturally to women. Like Fatma was saying, of course, there's always the man who's in touch more with that side, but I think it comes naturally more to women that connectivity, which I think is very important today. That's a very interesting point. I'd love to hear uh, Farida your reflections on that. Like, obviously, the the whole concept of women in leadership and this debate has really risen up to the surface with COVID nineteen. Uh, yeah. You know, talks about uh, prime ministers like Jacinda Ardern or like amazing successful uh, leadership uh, examples around us. What are your reflections on it? And I'd love if, as part of your answer, you can tell us a little bit more about something you mentioned offline when we were prepping for this. You talked about the feminist theory of law. So I would love to hear more about that from you. Sure, thank you for, um, yes, okay. Um, (laughs) um, No, it's a pleasure. I mean, so many things to say, I, I, I think, we are in the presence of a truly unique family business model. Um, I think it is, it's almost as if um, the traditional model, which is the majority of cases we have in the Middle East and North Africa, and to be fair, around the world, um, you know, studies show that around the world, family businesses are still rather patriarchal, it, it, it's seen as an exception, you know, if you have a female, for example, founder. So if let's say you have a second generation business and the founder is female, people actually look up like they're like, oh, this is special. So it just shows you how um, it is not the common, um, the common denominator. It is not the normal um, case. Um, however, first point here that I'd like to make is We have to be very careful when we talk, especially in our region, when we speak about female leadership roles and we only attribute leadership roles to people we see. So um, one of the things that we all know in our Arab culture is that behind the scenes, 
leadership is also lived. So you might have a very male dominated family business, but then if you look behind the scenes, you see that a lot more people actually have a say. And there might be a very strong um, woman perhaps that actually is what sometimes is coined in the US, they call them the chief emotional officer, right? So someone who kind of holds the family together from an emotional perspective, but with a very strategic brain. So it's not just a person who's just nice to everybody. It's a person who actually can have a holistic view of the family and say, in order for us to be commercially successful, we need to be emotionally successful. And that takes a lot of leadership and that takes also a lot of self-knowledge and it cannot be done driven by ego. And I think this is where we have a very big distinction, right? As a person, you have to realize whether your ambition can only be fulfilled if you are visible. And I think for a lot of women, um, you know, sometimes they have this, this tendency to be okay with being powerful without being visible. So that's just my first comment, because I'm almost debunking my own statistics here, because I do think that those statistics um, are obviously only taking into consideration who has a business card, who has a name on the door, and that, that is the person we count as a leader, right? So that would be kind of my first, my first comment. Um, the second comment would be around, you know, why, why do we want female leadership? And that kind of links to, to my first slide. We want female leadership because, um, you know, the world is complex and you need different people with different opinions to be able to take leadership decisions or to contribute to leadership uh, decisions. Now, I think tradition and culture really play a huge role. And, you know, it's the same thing. We work with family businesses around the MENA, but we also have connections with Asian family businesses, African family businesses, Latin American family businesses. And you really see there is a bit of a tension sometimes between mm -hmm. the culture and the reality of the overall society that you live in. So, you know, what is, what is the community that you were born into? And then the culture and the values of your own nuclear family. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those are completely aligned. So if your culture and society does, for example, not want to see women in public and your family corresponds with that vis vision and that value, then it's going to be very difficult for you as a woman to make your way into the corporate world successfully into your family business. Right. <clears throat> However, in, in, in Tharawat, we see a lot of families that are, that come from cultural backgrounds that are quite conservative when it comes to female participation in public, but that have an inner culture and a family culture that actually wants to empower the most talented people. So they actually live like a meritocracy um, as opposed to the kind of very flat one dimensional rules that you have around you. So I think what we will see more and more also with, and we have to be very, very clear, there is a shift, a generational shift that is happening. Millennials, I think by 2030, millennials will be 70% of the workforce. Mm -hmm. So those are the people, right, born in the 1980s, tech savvy, connected. So the perception of what looks like a leader is also changing. And Absolutely. I think that is going to influence a lot of, uh, of points. And my last point, you wanted me to mention um, uh, feminist legal theory. Yes, I have to bring the lawyer in you. Everybody has to know you are a lawyer. So at the end of this. <laughs> yeah, I can never suppress it long enough. That's, that's, that's true. <laughs> But I will, just, I will just mention it very briefly and, and also why, why I mentioned it in our last conversation. It actually links into my last point with regards to the societies that we function in. Okay. Feminist legal theory um, says that inherently because the majority of people who built what we call the outside world, everything that is outside your own home, the, the societal structure, right? were male over the past, I mean, let's say a couple of thousand years, people who left the house to do things were mostly majority were male, which means that the structure, the systems, the procedures were built to mirror male behavior. And so feminist legal theory, and it actually coincides with a lot of other feminist theories, says that 
in order to achieve true um, equality in terms of access and, and, and possibilities, you need to question the system as well as push the people. So that's kind of in a very, very, very small nutshell what sure. feminist theory is. No, but it makes a lot of sense because, I mean, it, t it ties in beautifully with the entire debate about leadership today, about the need to revise policies, about the need to even, you know, be considerate of whatever future policies are coming, whether for artificial intelligence or for whatever new fields are coming up in our world. Um, I go back to this lovely picture of Amina working with uh, her mother, and I, I just want to say, you know, it's a challenge for most women, obviously, that they are in uh, male dominant environments. But in your case, it, this wasn't, as we said, the challenge. And um, I'd like to, to, to hear a little bit more from you about how inspirational your mother was to you in your journey. And before I give you the floor, I would just like to share a very small short story, uh, which I don't think I've ever shared with you, ladies. Um, but actually, I don't know if you know, Rana uh, Al Salim and I, our friend from school, uh, we had actually run away from school one day, like left early, uh, skipped school. You know, we used to do this sometimes. I hope my dad's not watching. Um, but we actually walked out of school. We were in high school. And uh, our school was in a very, you know, it's in, uh, it's in an area called Al Haram in uh, Cairo, for whoever's familiar with Cairo. And it was next to, yeah, it was quite, you know, amidst farms and so on. And while we were walking out, uh, hoping to cab it or, you know, get a taxi and stuff, um, Madame Azza Fahmi stopped her car, your mom, and uh, she was like, uh, girls, come, come, come in my car. And I was like, uh, La, it's okay, I don't, we will just get a cab and whatever. She's like, no, 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 I can't leave you here. Don't worry, I'm uh, Fatma and Amina's mom, come, come, I'll take you home. And throughout the drive from Haram to Mohandesin, where she dropped us off, she told us her entire uh, story, the way she started, uh, the way she used to go to Khan al Khalili and, you know, hang out there and be like what she called it, a uh, sabi, fil warsha. Uh, obviously, at the time, only boys did that job. Uh, she took up that job herself. She actually worked with the artisana and the craftsmen uh, in Khan al Khalili. And this is how passionate she was. She went out of her way. She went in a male dominant environment. She just proved herself, you know, she just did it. And obviously I was like completely wowed at this time. I was in high school. I had never seen something like it. I grew up as part of a, you know, relatively conservative family. And I was like, this is just incredible. So how has, I mean, your mother is an inspiration to me. So how has she inspired uh, you ladies? Uh, first of all, I'm sure my mom is very happy to hear this story. I think she's with us <laughs> on the lecture, so she's very happy. To uh, it's such a hard question to answer because it came in phases. I think when you're growing up, as much as you're connected to your mother and you're, you're seeing her day-to-day -day going in and out, doing, trying to balance her work life and her mother, like her being as a mother and her being also trying to give her house. And because my mother is a very homey person, she loves her home and she loves everything about her house. But I, don't, I, I think with time, you really appreciate that because when you're growing up, what you see, so that's all you know. You know, you, you don't think that there's a world outside of that. You, you, you think of your mother as that is the benchmark and that's how we all have to be. Um, but after um, university and when, when I joined the business and you, you really start to see how challenging it is to even just balance a social life and work. I mean, even that was a challenge. And then you, you move on to your life and you move into your 30s and you start to be more of a grown up or an adult and you... You, that inspiration that you're talking about becomes very clear to you because all of a sudden you realize that what I perceived in my early teens as my mother being normal is the opposite of normal. You know, I, I 
to me, when we were, I remember in high school and someone would say, what do you want to do? I would automatically say, I'm a, I'll be a jewelry designer. And I couldn't comprehend how you would ask a 17 year old what you want to do and he doesn't have a straight answer. That is so weird for me. But then you grow up to see that that's not the normal either. And I remember maybe four or five years ago when we started further expanding in England and you get a question of how does it feel to be part of a female workforce and being from a fail, um, female um, industry and we would look at each other like it's a very bizarre question like what do you mean how does it feel you know and it's the more the more you get um, the more you start dealing with people who are having a very set of different problems the more i see my mother as a true inspiration because she really had to defy so much and she made it seem like it was normal you know we didn't feel like it was a struggle or a burden or i'm sure it was so hard but it was she saw the target she saw the vision and she ran for it she didn't let anything stop her that's incredible incredible yeah. I want to say something very similar to Amina. I think recently, and that's only recently, because you know, you you get asked that question a lot, and like on any in any interview, in any uh, panel, like so, what is it, what the challenges of being a woman? And that question, a lot of the time, really gets on my nerves because I feel like my challenges are not because I'm a woman. My challenges are because I want to grow a business or I'm looking for finance. Like I always, I've I've never seen myself that being a woman is a disadvantage. And, and I think that really is a luxury that now I'm realizing was, was given on. to us, passed on by my mother. So I never feel like, I've never walked into a meeting. I've never you know, sat on a lot of boards. I've never walked into a meeting feeling like, oh my God, I'm, I'm the only the woman only here. Woman. I don't see the, the, the man woman lens, but I realized recently that that's only there because my mother didn't make us see it. Absolutely. Maybe, maybe I can chime into this because I think that's a very, very interesting point. Um, so I, I also work with my sisters. We have a family business. And so I, I'm kind of in a similar position with you, um, except for, of course, my father um, is there and he, he has always, he has never questioned the fact that we were women. I have never heard one single time that my father said to me, you can't do this because you're a woman. Um, there's never been that, 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 perception. So I do think that your childhood um, and your childhood experiences are essential for how you then grow as, a, as an adult and how you perceive your gender as being either, you know, an, an advantage or a disadvantage. But interestingly enough, and, and this is also one of the reasons why we launched Women in Family Business as a, as a, as a not-for-profit platform, um, we wanted to have this conversation with more, more women because there is not really Sometimes women don't realize this, you know, it's, it's exactly what you say. Sometimes we just get on with stuff and, and it's only when you actually sit them down and you ask them, do you think these challenges came because you're a woman or because, you know, you were a leader and you had to get something done that they start analyzing it a little bit. And, you know, sometimes I am, I, I completely agree with you. Sometimes I don't think it's the right question to ask um, because, you know, as a leader, you just, you take whatever challenge comes your way and you work with it. And if you ask the majority of women that I've spoken to in family businesses, they ultimately say with all the obstacles that it brings uh, to, be, to be female, it, they mostly see it as an advantage because the moment you realize that there is um, something maybe that you see that someone who, has, who is male cannot perceive or cannot understand, you start using those advantages. And I think this is where um, it makes us perhaps stronger to have to overcome these challenges. Um, and if you overcome them with a bit of awareness, um, you know, it, they become tools and they become sometimes weapons um, that you can use. So, so I do think that it's a, it's a very difficult, I, I, I agree with you. I don't like the question. I think we have to ask the question. But I don't like the question. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> it's amazing that you both have such, you know, with the, such similar backgrounds. Like for me, it's a completely different ball game. I grew up in a very patriarchal, uh, patriarchal family. Uh, you know, yes, we were all part of the business, the family business. I grew up as part of the family business. We're exactly like you. We used to go to the clothes stores, uh, do sales, warehousing, accounting. 
packaging, you name it. We had to know everything. Um, but at the end of the day, there was always this notion that, you know, the, the boy will be, you know, will take the helm of things. Or um, so there was always, it was a very different setup. And I think it plays a very, you know, it, it makes sense with what uh, Farida, you said earlier about traditions and culture and, and how much they affect and influence such decisions in our region. So, so um, Fatma, going back to you, did you really have to work hard to earn the position of uh, CEO of Azza Fahm? Or was it like handed over to you, you know? Was it by default going to be you? Or do you think that if you hadn't worked hard, it could have been given to someone else? No, it, it was never by default me. And, and, and even recently, I tried to not let it be me again, but <laughs> it sort of keeps coming back to me. So it's, I think it's- I have no choice. <laughs> away from it and it comes back to me so, uh, yeah. so actually I, I joined I actually thought I'd be a designer so I was studying fine arts oh wow I had decided to not travel which was one of my uh, one of the very few wrong decisions I think I've made in my life to not travel to because I got the opportunity and I said no and so I studied fine arts but then I realized so I'll be I'll join the design department uh, but then I had so much time on my hands because the college wasn't taking up that much in, uh, here in Cairo. So I actually, so my mother said, so why don't you come to the company? Just do like part-time. And what started off yeah. like a part-time junior in the marketing department um, and ended up with 20 years later, I'm still here. But, by but it also gave me a completely different route than I thought I would take. So I ended up joining marketing and realizing I'm super passionate about marketing and branding and, and I had that vision and then it was time for Amina to go to college so Amina went and studied jewelry design uh, and so I grew in the commercial side of the business um, I think I was there for like six years as a junior between marketing sales and different departments and then I was deputy to a GM which we had and then so it, it grew very very organically so I've really worked in every single part of the business uh, I think the challenge actually summer for me is the opposite, is that recently I've realized I think I want to move on and do something different. Uh, and it's not so easy because we have a very particular culture in the company and we also have a very particular industry. I think one of our biggest challenges is that we come from a unique industry that does not have the support ecosystem where we come from. So we're not doing a luxury or a jewelry brand in Paris or Milan, where everything there is set for that, you know? So it's, uh, so it, it, for me, that's one of my, my biggest challenges. And, and for us as a company, it's, you know, it's getting talent, it's finding benchmarks, it's, it's having a whole ecosystem. And that's what we're trying to build today, because that's the only way you can grow a whole industry. You can't grow on your own. So Actually, it's something I would like to, I, I don't see myself as the CEO forever because I want to be involved in a more strategic role and really grow the business in a, in a different direction, which yeah. means we need to bring someone in. Well, actually, uh, statistically, family business CEOs last for 20 odd years versus an average of six years in, in, in private sector companies. So, news or bad news. Good luck with so that. <laughs> Good luck with you. <laughs> <laughs> La, but, uh, mashallah, you did a great job um, taking Azza Fahmi's name together to, uh, you know, global scale. And I, I know we just passed the uh, picture of Amina with um, Matthew Williamson. Uh, you've had amazing designer collaborations. You're now, you know, you are now present in London, in Dubai, in like, uh, in uh, Beverly Hills, I believe. And um, uh, lots of uh, different places. Uh, I'd love to hear more from Amina about uh, your journey with design and how did you manage to bring these amazing designer collaborations um, with Azza Fahmi? I'd love to hear that. Uh, my design journey, uh, I, I pretty much always knew what I wanted. Yeah, always so since I was seven I knew very much what I wanted to do and I knew that the education here would not provide me with that support um, but actually I had gotten accepted in uh, in the University of Central England which was one of the top universities for jewelry design uh, in Birmingham 
and uh, I had a year off uh, because they said I couldn't join until I was 18. And Fatma had just returned from Italy. She had done a few uh, art courses there. And she said, Amina, instead of staying back home in Cairo while all your friends are university, you're going to be doing nothing for a year. Why don't you go to Italy and learn something and do something until university officially starts? So we had, um, my mother was in the World Gold Council and they had recommended the school. And at the time, the internet was just still kicking in, but it was very challenging. You know, there was no Google. You couldn't really get to the bottom of things. So we, I actually went to Florence. Literally, we had no idea what, what I was getting myself into. And they had accepted me by mistake. They read on the application that I was 27 when I was actually 17. So I show up on the first day of school and both the teachers just look at me like, oh my God, you're so young. <laughs> like, you're so young. You're a baby. And it turned out to be one of the most fabulous schools in Europe. They're a contemporary jewelry school. There are only 25 people. There, there were almost about 10 teachers. So the the one-on-one -on -one was incredible. And later on, we actually collaborated with them. That's the Azafahmi Design School. So actually, we eventually partnered up with them 15, 20 years later. And I went to Birmingham and completed my bachelor's degree um, in jewelry design and silversmithing. And I think it was actually that five and a half stay uh, in, in, in Europe that had a very, very um, strong influence on the designer I eventually became. Um, I joined in 2005 and I remember for the first three years, my mother would just ask me to listen. You know, I came back thinking that I have a bachelor's degree and I know it's all and you know, I should automatically start designing. And she was like, what are you doing? Just sit at the back and just listen, you know? And for three years, I literally did a lot of, um, rotation in many many departments just to get a feel and understanding of the entire business as a whole and in 2008 i was actually ready it took us three years to really prep me after college before i could launch um, my first collection the collaboration part of the process came much later on when we wanted to enter the uk market and it was very very challenging because like fatma was saying we don't come from a region where there are were a lot of jewelry designers. So you you went knocking on doors and people had no idea why would they see you? Why would they waste your time? They've never heard of another jewelry designer or fashion designer even from um, from Egypt. So the best way in was through collaborations because that person, whether the first collaboration we did was with Julian McDonald, he he had his strong presence in the UK and we had the strong presence in, um, in the region. So together, he, we, he wanted to expand further in the Middle East and we wanted to enter the UK market. And what we found out about collaborations, whether it was Julian McDonald or Preen by Thornton Bergese later on or Matthew Williamson, where we did three collaborations together, was that two heads are always better than one because that person the fashion industry is very different it's very diverse it's going back to this diversity and when you're sitting with a designer who's used to a very different timeline and a very different um uh, process of designing you you end up getting into that mode when you're designing for a catwalk you're no longer thinking small and tiny and everything you have to think of of something that has to be seen at about 100 meters away. And that allowed my peak perspective. And um, it allowed us to really think outside the box. And I actually think that it, the internet connection, oh, sorry. And then it, I think actually over time, it allowed us to change the, the way we style things and the way we do things because we had that opportunity to work with these lovely designers. So that exposure actually influenced the business processes or operations. It, 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 it may perhaps affected, influenced your strategy in a way that's that's wonderful. I mean, uh, what about uh, maybe challenges that you have faced? And I'd love, I'm conscious of time, by the way, this is a such an enjoyable conversation that I'm, we're actually, we only have like 15 minutes left. So um, I just want, would like the audience to know that we are receiving questions. So please uh, start sharing your questions on the Q&A window. Uh, I, I picked uh, one that was actually repeated twice and it's about digitization. 
Um, have you digitized anything in Azza Fahmi as part of this, you know, taking the brand to global scale? What have you had to do in terms of changes? Because I mean, Azza Fahmi is all about uh, working by hand. It's all about the artisana and the craftsmanship and so on. So how does that influence you? Is it only in business processes or is it actually in manufacturing as well? Fatma, perhaps, I can think, tell us. Uh, I think um, it's it's a very fine balance, Summer, when it comes to, uh, of course, we, we've, we've become much more uh, digital, technologically, I mean, geared and all that, but it's always about the balance. So it's always about, you know, where do you go from having the, the, the technology and the, and the digital world serve you? And where do you lose that? So on the product front, we're still a handmade product. So even though today uh, the, the, the world has advanced so much that you can get one machine where you put a design in on the other side comes a ring with the stone set, it's not what we do because we believe in the perfect imperfections of the handmade and that every piece looks different and that that process is very important to us because we also keep a lot of traditional techniques alive uh, by that. However, there's definitely a, a, a technological and digital side to things that makes the process more efficient. So again, it's that balance. Even if we go as far as, as, as our e-commerce, uh, where we have e-commerce, the question we always ask ourselves is, how do we make it personal? How do we build that relationship with clients? How does it not become a machine that you're talking to? Because that very personal story of Aza Fahmi and that bond we have and those little stories, like the story you shared somewhere is, is very personal. We went to school together, but our clients have these stories about the pieces, about when they bought the piece or what that piece means to them. And making sure that that stays, even though we're completely digital, is very important to us. So that balance is always key. not losing that connection. Is, is very key to us. That makes a lot of sense. And I think uh, it's, uh, it's a good time now to move to Farida to talk to us about uh, succession planning and corporate governance. And that's one like hot topic, I guess, for family businesses in general. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, especially, I mean, in this case, we have a mother, we have two daughters. Uh, when I asked offline uh, Fatma and Amina about uh, their children, if they'll be part of the business, they're like, of course, they have no choice. <laughs> so I'd love to hear from you, what are the best practices when it comes to that? Because I mean, we have our own struggles ourselves in, in, in my family business as well. It's, it's quite challenging. It can get, you know, quite daunting at times. You feel like, you know, why am I in the middle of this? <laughs> but I think planning is really important. And uh, tell us about what's happening in the region. How many hours do you have? Um, I think it's, it's so first of all, I, I apologize for, for this very dry topic after such a wonderful <laughs> conversation. Um, I'll, try, I'll try to contextualize it in a bit of a charming way because there are nice ways to talk about governance and succession planning. Um, I, I'd like to kind of link into what Fatma said just now about, you know, digitization um, and, and I'll explain why it links to succession planning. We are, and it is a reality, we are living through the fourth industrial revolution. Um, this, this disruption affects every business. It, it doesn't matter which, uh, which industry we're in, it doesn't matter which country we're in. Um, it, it, the reality is that technology is impacting how we do things. And in order to remain um, competitive as a business, we need to understand that there is a reality we need to take into consideration. So, so I think what you're saying, Fatma, is, um, is, is absolutely the right way to go about it. Family businesses have survived across generations. And again, we have to emphasize a minority of businesses survive over generations. To, to, to be successful across generations has a lot of, it's, it's not a very easy thing to do. So that's the first thing I'd, I'd like to say. The second thing is that, of course, preparing for succession is a long-term project. So we have to understand that succession is not just who becomes the next cha uh, chairperson. It's not just who becomes the next CEO. Um, succession planning is a complex um, 
concept and it is a holistic process that we have to go through. So what I would like to say is that we cannot just say um, succession is a one way street. It's not a piece of paper. Um, and what, what Amina and Fatma have gone through is, in my opinion, exactly what succession should look like. Um, it has to be a natural process. So if you are in a family business and you have, for example, not been able to identify yourself with, your, with this company and that the DNA of this company is not part of your own DNA, it's going to be very difficult for you to be a successful leader and to take over what you just said, um, Fatma, I'm quoting you a lot, but you said very smart things. Um, so I think you need to represent what makes this business special and what makes it successful. And you can only do that if you have an understanding, an inherent understanding of this, the complexity of the situation and of the culture of the company. So, so those would be a couple, of, a couple of points that I would like to make. In addition, I would say that it's, it's less of a paper trail. It's less of something that um, uh, I would say <laughs> um, consultants, for example, could, could give you. It is a process that has to go through the, through the system uh, in a natural way. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I bet you ladies are already working on that for <laughs> So planning for the future of Azza Fahmi and uh, the management and what's next. Um, we have received a couple of questions. Um, one says that several studies indicate that more than 95% of family businesses do not succeed and reach the fifth generation. What is the key takeaway for overcoming this and ensure resilience, continuity, and thrive for family business? What would you say, Farida? Well, I would already say that five generations is already very ambitious. <laughs> I think, you know, if you make it through to the second generation, you're doing a good job already. Um, so uh, I think, you know, it's such a complex process. I once read a study that said um, in the Singaporean stock exchange, on average, the average age of a company was 12 years. Mm -hmm. 12 years, right? So a family business that has already lasted through the first generation in its entirety, let's say 30, 40 years perhaps, is probably already outperforming kind of the average listed company. So, you know, we have to give family businesses a bit, a bit of credit in, with regards to how they manage to overcome. And, and we also have to be very realistic. We, we do live in a region that has geopolitical complexities and we have shifting realities. And the, 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 the fact is that external as well as internal factors impact and influence whether you will successfully be able to hand over a family business to the next generation, right? So when we look at succession and we look at how to hand over a business to the next generation. One thing that I always say is, perhaps you need to look at what you want to preserve. Mm -hmm. And perhaps we have to accept that the form of what you want to preserve might change. So it might not look the same, right? You might want to preserve a certain product line or you might want to preserve, maybe, maybe your passion are your employees. Maybe you want to you know, continue employing people, but that doesn't mean that it always has to look the same way. So I think, academic research into succession and, and these numbers that we, you know, that we're very, that we're throwing around, we have to be very careful, first of all, where they come from, second of all, how they were measured, and then also be a little bit, I mean, it sounds very unprofessional, but be a bit kind, you know, and generous to these family businesses, uh, that they are already performing extremely well in comparison to other businesses. I think it's fair. I think it's. Uh, I think what you're suggesting is extremely fair. And I move on to the uh, to Fatma. Uh, there's a question that uh, that asks about the uh, main challenges that you say face family businesses in 2020. And I'll take this opportunity to also ask you about you know how obviously with the COVID pandemic currently taking place and so on. If you can also reflect on how we are currently trying to maintain balance in our lives working from home? I think this ties in well with that question. Uh, 2020 is definitely, I, mean, I don't think we need to tell anyone how challenging this year is. 
uh, and I'm sure for some industries it's okay, but uh, in the luxury jewelry industry, it's uh, we're hit quite hard. Uh, so I like something Farida just said very much. It's uh, looking at what you want to preserve. Uh, that's very important. And I think for us, it's always a question we go back to asking ourselves. We're like, okay, so what's important now? Because because at a time of crisis, you can't keep everything. You can't juggle all balls. You can't look at everything. So it's survival mode. So for us, for example, and this is the sort of the second crisis I faced when I'm running the business. The first one was the, the revolution. Uh, is we always go back and say, okay, so our priority is the people. For example, that's, that's, that's our priority at Aza Fahmi. And so then how do things work so we can uh, retain people as much as possible? How does it work? And uh, while keeping the business alive and all that. So it's, it's really going back to, to the fundamentals and saying, okay, so what's important today? What are we keeping alive? And it's really going back to that core, core, core of what you do. But also, I always feel that uh, times of crisis also have a lot of opportunities in them because you become very efficient. Uh, you gain fat along the years that is not necessarily needed. Uh, you lose sometimes track or you get distracted by a lot of things that are not necessarily in the best interest. So really, a time, that kind of pressure that a crisis puts on you, I believe companies that come out of it, most of them co come out much stronger and much more efficient. And if you look at it even a bit further as an opportunity, uh, you can come out with great, great, great uh, success. You know, a, a good example in the luxury industry, which also is talking, ties in with Farida's point about succession, is, is a company like Hermes. Hermes were saddle makers. I mean, back 300 years ago or 200 years ago, they're saddle makers. And suddenly it was a shift between generations where they realized people are not riding horses anymore they're going for cars. And I'm sure there were a hundred more saddle makers out there that were, had amazing craftsmanship, but they didn't see that as an opportunity. So it's looking at the time of crisis and that's a crisis for a saddle maker that there are no more horses and people are riding cars. And Hermes, building on what Farida was saying, looked at what their core competence was. It's not just saddle making, it's that craftsmanship in leather. And, and in Hermes's logo today, they have the saddle and they have the horse, but it's not what they do. They still do saddles, but I mean, that's not their core business. But again, it's going back to that fundamentals and looking at the crisis. And I'm, I'm saying this when sometimes it's very stressful and you cannot look beyond what will happen tomorrow. I'm, I'm not saying it's easy in any way, but it's always an opportunity. It's always an opportunity to do something different. And usually, I mean, I believe we can come out much stronger. Uh, during a crisis um, and one question just came in on the same topic saying what do you think is the what would be the magic skill set and capabilities to navigate through these volatile times what would you say is the one skill set that well, is really uh, helping you navigate but i think adaptability and and ag being able to ver becoming very agile is key Mm -hmm. uh, it's, I mean, one obviously doesn't work because you need more than one skill set. But if I would choose the most important at a time of a crisis, uh, it's agility. And, and it's being able to adapt and adjust and, and react very quickly and not be too heavy. Because then you can sink. It's like quicksand, you know, you can, you really need to be able to know what to do and move quickly. A lot of sense. And I think a lot of the points that you mentioned, especially that you talked about people, and about um, how important people are for the organization, especially when it comes to family businesses. Uh, I know th this will be m the last uh, point maybe to discuss. I recall going to um, Mona al Gurg's office uh, once. She's the chairperson of the Young Arab Leaders. And uh, she, I met someone at her office who had been with the company for 30 odd years. And I, I bet you probably have uh, this kind of, you know, longevity. Right or relationship, yes, with employees at Azza Fahmi. Uh, I think these are, at the end of the day, one of the most important assets for any business, and it all boils down to, you know, your values as a business, and, and this makes a lot of uh, difference when it comes to the legacy that you're trying to build for the brand uh, down the line. Um, if there are any uh, final reflections from you, uh, Farida, on everything that was mentioned, maybe just to tell us what do you think that one skill uh, is for survival to navigate through these rough times? 
Well, no, I think I think I can absolutely agree with uh, Fatma here um, on 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 those two points. Uh, I, I believe, in a in a in a sense, fearlessness is 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 also part of it. You know, um, I think if you if you have to navigate a group of people through moments where everything seems against you, uh, where your industry, not just you as an individual company, but where your entire industry is not just being disrupted, but you know. To a certain extent, being fundamentally challenged, um, I do think that you need to be a fearless leader, uh, and you need to accept that you're going to make mistakes uh, along the way because you cannot be fearless without accepting that fact. Um, but yeah, I think all of us as business leaders are. I think that is the biggest struggle you might have is to say how, what is the risk level that I am willing to accept uh, and, and that I'm also willing to put my people through because every risk that I take, I take on behalf of the entire organization. So I think fearlessness is, is um, a skill set that uh, is very, very important, but also difficult to obtain. And on my side, I would just add that uh, I agree with both of you, obviously, as a startup, it's also a very tough time uh, for all startups. Um, we have, we're trying to digitize, we're, we've moved a lot of our you know, uh, operations online as well. There's so much happening in the background, uh, but I think this is a good uh, uh, wrap for, the, for an amazing conversation with all of you. So thank you very much for your time today. Um, this, uh, rec the recording of this webinar will be available, will be shared with you, and it will be posted on uh, She is Arab's YouTube channel, and it will also be posted by the Young Arab Leaders through their own uh, social media outlets. Uh, thank you for being with us today from Egypt, Fatma and Amina. Thank you so much, and thank you, Farida. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. This thank was you very much. It's a pleasure. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye.